Good evening everybody, my name is Alice McGrath and I'm very pleased to be here tonight to present the Mary Ward Justice Lecture. Before I introduce myself a little bit more, I was very interested to present to you some footage of the very place that I find myself in at the moment. And it's part of the reason why I can't join you in person tonight, because I'm on the other side of the world and I hope to give you a little bit more of an understanding about the sort of environment that we live here in Palestine. This film that you've just seen is a small depiction of some of the issues that the people and the community and our most vulnerable people here face. But one thing that has struck me in my time living here is the power of the human spirit and a determination to enjoy life in the face of adversity. Today I would like to start my presentation on asking a question. What does justice mean? What does justice mean for all of us in a world where we come from different cultures, languages, countries and colours? And this is something that I would like to share with you today is something of my journey to try and discover how to answer that question. And it's the reason why I've titled the presentation today, uh, A Journey Towards Understanding, What is Justice in a Divided World? For me, as an ex-student of Loreto College, um, I feel like I started with a foot in the right direction. It was at school that I learned much about this, my social surroundings, not only with the support of staff and students from the school, with whom I'm still friends, it's also gave me the insight about my local surroundings, the social justice issues that we face in, in Adelaide and the wider surrounds of, of Australia. This is something that I would really like to connect, on, connect to and to touch upon a little bit more during the course of my presentation today about what learning I've taken from my home in Australia and in Adelaide and from Loreto, but also what lessons I can bring home to share with yourselves who continue the very good work and community spirit in Australia. I think what I'll start by saying today is, and I do reiterate that we will actually have some time live today to have some questions and answers. So in the course of my discussion, it would be really, if you think of any questions, please save them. And I understand that we will have an opportunity via a Skype technology to be able to share some, um, some thinking together. I started my life after, to, after Loreto as a lawyer um, with the Legal Services Commission in South Australia and moved to do some work with the, the Aboriginal legal aid arm in the Northern Territory. That was for me a very, very big learning ground to understand and try and connect the issues that people and families and most importantly, young people face and how indeed they uh, cope with um, modern day problems. When I moved to the Northern Territory and working mostly as a lawyer with young people um, from Aboriginal communities, it was then that I started to ask myself the question, what does justice mean to these young people? What does justice mean to their families? And how does it sit in the context of our justice system that we have in various states throughout Australia? For me and for many of my colleagues and indeed the community around, this can sometimes cause a clash in, in community values. How mums and dads and families wish to look after their children and sometimes cannot cope in, in certain situations with the way in which children are behaving. But is the answer to treat them through the criminal justice system. Certainly, there's many people who commit crimes against people in this country and in around the world, and, and justice has to be dealt with. Punishments have to be served, and at times people have to, to go to jail. But when we look at young people in general, and we think, what would life be like if they were given a second chance, for instance? What what is their family environment that is causing them to, to, uh, to cause these problems? And indeed, what are the cultural values that are associated with, with life in the family unit that might be somewhat at odds with modern day treatment of, of young people in terms of charging them, taking them to court 
And then I had the opportunity to move to the Northern Territory and work with the Aboriginal Legal Aid Service. And that for me was a fantastic opportunity, not only to see and to meet people from very far away places and travel to communities, sometimes where we would have to drive through crocodile ridden rivers for eight, 10 hours just to reach a community, but to see a way of life that I'd never seen before. And also to see how communities cope in the face of problems uh, that are caused by young people and attract the attention of the police and the courts and detention centres. So for me to act as a defence lawyer and to work and learn from my colleagues was something of an extension of my interest in trying to answer the question, what is justice? For us as people from Australia and people from a Western contemporary culture, for me it certainly rings a, a bell to say justice is truth, is it not? And this is a question that we will return to in later during this presentation because we'll find that some communities have other priorities before truth in some instances. And these sort, this sort of learning and this exposure um, where one really learns on their feet and is inspired by the work of our friends and of, of colleagues and also through the sense of rehabilitation that you see through young people who move through a process, who manage to overcome the problems that they faced and the problems that they've caused to other people in their community and start to do good for their family. But my question wasn't answered. What does justice mean? And, and really, I, at that point, I felt like I was ready to, to travel the world and to work in different environments to improve my own skill base um, but also, again, to try and think of some lessons to bring back home. And then when I left Australia, it was another exciting journey, not only to live outside of the country for the first time and to meet new people and to eat interesting food and to listen to different music. Really, it gave me some insight into some of the other justice mechanisms that operate throughout the world. My first port of call was Mongolia in Central Asia and that was a fantastic opportunity for me to see a country that has just emerged from a state of long-term communist rule to a free market democracy where a whole world of opportunity awaited. But fundamental mechanisms such as having government funded defence lawyers for, for children and adults was not present in this system. And that was part of my work, was to help establish these mechanisms. My work then took me to places such as Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And perhaps some of us here tonight are more familiar with these environments, with them being so close to Australia. Yet, these environments really struck me as places that are of great interest, because so many cultures living together so many tribes, so many languages, so many different ways of thinking, living in one often small piece of land and living relatively harmoniously. But again, we have situations where children uh, are making mistakes and come to the attention of the police. And really my role in these environments was to help build the capacity of the, the judges, the lawyers, the prosecutors and the prison staff to really help them understand how to work with, uh, with young people in this setting. Again, some of the way things that I saw in these country settings and the way in which families and communities and tribal leaders would address the question of justice sat at odds with what I'd understood from my Western inspired legal training at Flinders University. Really this sense of having to make good to a victim was something that really struck me as interesting. And when I started to think a little bit more about the ways in which communities access justice, particularly in places that are very very far away from a town, maybe they live on a small island for instance, there's over 150 islands that make up the country of Solomon Islands, most of which do not have a police officer or a court or a jail 
on these islands. What did these communities do to dispense with justice? Well, in fact, this forms the central core to community life, learning how to get along. And the sense of community is so, so intact that community decisions are made with the leadership of a tribal chief, for instance, um, and other selected community leaders. And slowly, these sorts of mechanisms were coming to make more sense for me. And making and begging the question, what about our system of justice in Australia, in the European and Western context? How does that sit with communities that carry their own cultural values and ways of conflict resolution that might not be recognised by our police and courts and judicial system? And this is something that we face in the current place where I'm living now. And my journey takes me, as you saw on the map, to the Middle East. In places such as Afghanistan, you'll find that up to 90% of the population have no access to police and courts and jails and the like. And in fact, families and communities, again, headed by a leader in a different setting to the ones that we see, to the examples that I, that I spoke of in Papua New Guinea. But again, the process of conflict resolution and justice seeking are often done by the community and often very effectively. If we take a moment to pause and to think about the number of people who come to get into trouble, and if we reflect for a moment on young people, you'll find that the numbers in countries such as Afghanistan and Jordan and Palestine and even Lebanon are much less than the numbers that we see of children in places like Australia and the United States and Europe getting into trouble with the police. Yes, one might say, but are they reporting it in the same way? Is the technology and infrastructure in place for us to count like we, are, like we do in places like Australia? That might be the case. But overall, we know that because, and we can make a connection between a community and families living and coexisting in a way where we know where our children are, we monitor their behavior and we try and fix it at the earliest opportunity. These are the sorts of, um, these are the sorts of lessons that I've been learning. We also look to the influence of religious leaders in some of the countries where I've been living of late. And this is why I would like to pay some particular attention to the country context and the Palestinian communities that I've had the great fortune to work within. As an example, for the last year, um, in 2011 into 2012, I spent a lot of time in the south of Lebanon, working in the uh, Palestinian uh, refugee camps, where up to half a million Palestinian families are housed because they have no option to return to Palestine at this time and had fled um, the war in, in years previous. We will learn a little bit about the history of Palestine in one moment. But before that, I would like to impart the sort of mechanisms that are in place in these parts of the world to help answer the question, what is justice? The heads of the religious organisations and community leaders that sit within these camps represent the voice of the community. And when children get into trouble, which they invariably do, certainly in communities where you have very little room to move, very little um, play space and educational opportunities for young people, one can understand the frustrations that would be faced in this sort of context. So, what we also have is a complete absence of police and courts um, and the Lebanese authorities, which are responsible for the care of these camps, uh, do turn a blind eye to law and justice issues within this camp setting. And again, we, we make the point that over half a million people live in this situation. The sorts of social problems that we have seen emerge in these, in these contexts are perhaps in, in increase in, in issues related to mental health as well. This concept of mums and dads also being dispensed medication for, for depressive-like uh, illnesses of sorts. And 
seeing young people start to utilize the, the trade of pharmaceuticals um, to perhaps use on a more recreational basis as well. That's something of, um, uh, which we've seen as, as, as an increasing phenomenon. Not so much the sort of drug use and the like that we would see in, in countries like Australia and in Western settings. But what we do see is a real community response to these sorts of issues in, um, amongst leaders and amongst families. How do we as a community address these sorts of emerging issues and try and forecast for the future to help provide opportunities for young people? Well, I was really pleased to see that these are the sorts of questions that are actually being answered and potentially in a way that is more effective um, than some of the mechanisms that we try to struggle with in big bureaucracies that we face in our own context, such as Australia. Dealing with people one by one and trying to address through community ownership of a problem, um, how to, and, and working, starting to work with, the, with health professionals on a very serious level. For me, that was a really refreshing thing to see in an environment where resources are lacking but the human spirit and will to, to, to survive is, is, is quite big. My journey then took me to Palestine. And I'm in Palestine now, living in a place called Ramallah. And I think it's fitting that we, that we pause for a moment just to be able to understand the history of the conflict that has prevailed in this part of the world. Most of us hear about the country called Israel, and most of us have heard a little bit about Palestine. But sometimes it's very difficult for us to receive news um, and to understand in a balanced way what situation people face here and also what situation people have come from. So what I'm going to show you is a very small um, piece which helps describe the story about the history of Palestine and where it is today and why you might not see it on a map. So you've seen a small piece of the history and the situation of extreme pressure that the people here in Palestine face as a result of the occupation at the moment. And I live in a small town, uh, in a city called Ramallah. Um, it's a place I've always wanted to visit and I do encourage you to find out more about this wonderful city that sits only perhaps around 20 minutes from Jerusalem. In saying that, the journey to arrive to and from that is, is, can be very complex and to move through the checkpoints, the references of which you saw in the movie, can be extreme and sometimes it can take many hours for, for families uh, and individuals to move through these checkpoints. My role again here is to, to look at the justice spectrum in Palestine and I feel very lucky to be here again to work with, with young people and young people in Palestine represent up to 70% uh, of the population. Um, so you find that there's a lot of, the presence of young people is very obvious. But again a community that's once again very intact in many ways even in the face of extreme issues faced by the occupation um, and the conflict with Israeli, Israeli authorities on a day-to-day -day basis. So again our role is to look at the role of offending, looking at crimes that are committed, what sort of crimes are committed in Palestine and again we would note that they're rather minor in nature for young people. Now I'm going to talk just a briefly about what we do here in Palestine. It's very similar to the sorts of work that we have done uh, in other parts of the world. But again, it seizes this aspect of us working not only with the formal justice authorities, looking at the types of crimes that have occurred, looking at the role of police and how they treat young people and the sorts of services that they have to provide. Are they able, is there a capacity to investigate a crime? Is there infrastructure in place to sensitively interview witnesses? The sorts of things that we would see in a modern court and in criminal setting in, in, in places like Australia. Then our role is also to help build the capacity of judges and lawyers here as well 
another very fascinating feature, but also to inject this aspect of psychological and psychosocial assistance that is really part and parcel of understanding a young person who commits crimes. What was their situation at the time? Were they having difficulties in their life and school or were they indeed attending school and did they even have a home? These are the sorts of questions that need to be raised in, in, in these environments. But then again, looking at reconnecting families after the detention period if a child is sentenced to a term of imprisonment. But equally we face in this setting, as I said before, that young people often come to the attention of the community and never meet with police and courts. We would find that particularly in Gaza, and Gaza was mentioned in the film before. After a big conflict took place against Israeli authorities in 2007, Hamas, which is now the leading organisation uh, rule, ruling Gaza, they in fact took it upon themselves to to sack all the, to dismiss all uh, the judges and all the police officers and all the prosecutors that were sitting in their roles at that time and have since replaced them with, with colleagues and sometimes even friends who do not have any legal training. So if you can imagine judges sitting in a court that have never studied the law or never received the qualifications, would you have faith in a justice system to pursue it in that way? Many people in the community in Gaza say no and would rather resort to their local authorities. So as key points which I present on a slide to really demonstrate what informal justice means and, and the sort of features that it carries, we would see up to 90% of communities access informal justice in certain countries, particularly in times of war. You'll find that formal justice as we know it, police, courts and jails, they sometimes fall apart in times of, law, of, of war because the infrastructure is not there to carry it and law, in a sense, disappears. But community justice and living together to survive an, to, another, uh, to another dimension after, after the war, you would find that it's, it, it largely remains intact. More culturally relevant. Many communities believe that, again, as I've stipulated, police and courts are sometimes uncomfortable to address um, their own community concerns. Informal justice processes can be quick and you can get a speedy resolution that sometimes, in, in processes as we know, can take years. Even for a simple theft charge in some courts, even in Adelaide, we find that these processes can take a long time. And another key feature is obviously that it's not expensive uh, quite often and hiring lawyers and the like that are not accessible, some communities just lack the means in order to, to, to have these sorts of aspects. Building consultations and reconciliation, a fundamental feature is about the process of saying sorry which comes back to my question about what is justice and I think many communities agree and particularly the ones I've lived amongst and, and had the fortune to observe in Middle Eastern communities, in South Pacific communities and also in many communities in Northern Australia that reconciliation and saying sorry is fundamental to the process of healing not only by the offender but also of the victim. But there is room for improvement and this is something that I'm trying to learn more about and to work from in this context in Palestine. Not everyone gets a voice in informal justice processes. processes. If you can imagine a group of people coming together and a young person of about 12 years of age has done something to hurt another person. Say they have hurt another child at school or perhaps something more serious um, in terms of stealing a car or a sexual offence for instance. So these often accompanied by the family members, the, the aggrieved family, namely the victim's family and the children's family will often meet and have the, mediating, the, the, the meeting mediated by community and religious leaders. 
But a distinct feature of these processes is that sometimes a young person does not have the opportunity to present their side of the story. And indeed, in some cases, the child has not committed the crime at all. But these sorts of elements can be missed in some informal processes where restoration of social harmony, of the community sense of togetherness, sometimes takes priority over the truth. We do see this very sadly in some cases involving the sexual assault of girls in communities, um, particularly where the sexual assault against this girl is a source of shame for the family involved, indeed for the, for the victim, but also for the wider community that is involved. And sometimes a tendency to push the, 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 the situation away um, to achieve community peace. A lack of accountability as well. If, if someone wanted to say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with the decision of this informal court, then sometimes there is no remedy available to pursue this message further. These are the downsides, and I make this on the basis that this doesn't present overall as a feature, but these are the, some of the risks involved in processes um, not being pursued by formal means, where the rules of evidence are present, where rep people who are represented by people who have a sound knowledge in relation to the laws of the country, for instance, are represented. Sometimes it can just be families discussing and understanding what the, the best for everybody solution is. So on, on occasion, human rights breaches do occur. That's where our work comes in. And it's really fascinating to share stories and to learn from communities and indeed to help impart why it's so important that we have rules and behaviours that we as countries have signed. Uh, for instance, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that was a convention that was decided by all countries in, 1990, in 1989 and signed to promise that the rights of children will come first. But interestingly, Two countries out of all the countries in the world have still not signed this agreement to make sure that all of the rights of education, health, shelter, participation are assured by states as much as possible. What are those two countries, I ask you? Well, interestingly, one of them is Somalia because at the time of signing there were problems with the administration at the prime ministerial level to be able to legally sign the paper. This is something that's not uncommon. But the second country is the United States of America, who to this day still preserves the right uh, to indeed uh, exercise the right to do uh, such actions such as maintain the death penalty in, in extreme circumstances for, for young people under the age of 18. So these are the sorts of the work that still has to be done, um, elements that I'm very interested in and some of the stories that we like to share across the world. For now I will leave you um, because I think it's a really good opportunity for us to be able to ask some questions and to, to, to share some answers uh, with each other. To conclude, um, I would like to bring the story home and to reflect very briefly on the fact that all of the lessons that I feel like I'm learning is also so measured against the work that my friends and colleagues and family are doing at home and how we can transfer some of that learning that I've had to this context of what is justice in Australia. The slides that I'm showing you um, give you some context to the, the detention centre and prison environments that I've worked in, but also the artwork to the side uh, is by a young artist who's 15 years of age who has actually been sentenced to life imprisonment um, for a very serious crime committed at the age of around 14, um, but chooses uh, to contribute to society through his very good artwork and also through awareness raising sessions for young people um, on how not to, uh, to take the, a, a, a wrong direction in life as he likes to call it. 
but I do reflect on the settings that I've been exposed to, particularly with working with Indigenous communities who seek recognition um, in Australia in various ways, and particularly for some of the ways in which the community treats uh, young people um, and helping them to return to good law-abiding citizens. There's something to be said about this and it goes much further than the, the sorts of influences that um, some of us in uh, less community-oriented settings ha have had. Um, I very much look, look forward to some questions and answers um, and I understand that we've got the technology to do that. So I will leave that this now with a view to us being able to explore some of the ideas that I've presented today a little bit more further. Thank you very much and it's a wonderful opportunity to, um, to be able to present in this way.